Welcome, everyone, to the Fancy Fix here on Fox Sports 1340 AM. I'm Nicholas Wilcox, alongside with me is Corey Saunders. Corey, tell the people what's up. Hey, what's going on, everybody? I'm ready to get into some week one action, man. Let's get it, Nick. Yes, sir. Um, we are will be recapping uh, the Kansas City Chiefs smackdown on the New England Patriots and then be giving you guys some week one guys to possibly pick up to start um, and some outlooks, not only just for week one, but for, you know, some of the season moving forward. So, um, Corey, let's talk about last night's matchup between the Kansas City Chiefs on the road, uh, taking on the New England Patriots. As you know, and as we all know, New England got smacked last night by the Kansas City <laughs> right. 42 to 27. Um, your first initial thought of the game? Uh, from a real aspect, as far as like real life football, uh, yeah, Kansas really City looks like Kansas City looks like they're on a mission, man. Uh, they really, really, really went out there and went to prove a point that they are pretty much the exact team they were last year, which was a deep playoff team and they've only gotten better and they they look like they're really ready to make a run at the AFC championship. And from a fantasy standpoint, Kareem Hunt is exactly what people thought he would be. I mean, he came out and that first fumble and I was out with a group of friends of mine and that first fumble happened and they were like, Oh no, like I'm like, calm down, believe me, if anybody knows Andy Reid, it's me being a lifelong Eagles fan. He's going to continue to give him the ball. And then he goes on to have 246 yards from scrimmage. So there you go. I mean, Kansas City is is somehow looked at now almost as an offensive juggernaut with what they were doing last night. And you now have uh, Alex Smith, who we'll get into in a little bit, uh, really putting up some good numbers. I think overall initial thoughts were, I didn't think, you know, people didn't think Casey was going to hang with New England. Um, people were still, uh, you know, gung-ho about New England because of all the additions they made in the off season, And, mm-hmm. you know, and they were just really touting that. Um, they didn't think Casey had a shot. I think Vegas had New England as a 11-point favorite at home, which is understandable. Um, but let me watch the second half. And, man, things – um, you know, I gotta admit, I was like, you know, like I was New England should have been up fourteen nothing. Um uh-huh. the, the penalty that came back, Gronkowski had a touchdown early, that should have made it fourteen nothing. And I really could have that really could have changed the way I think things could have made this game um out to be because of that momentum. You know, for, fourteen nothing instead of seven nothing because Casey gets the ball back and it's only seven nothing. So after all the stuff that happened. Um, the second half, yeah, Casey came out and smacked him in the mouth. Um, Kareem Hunt, yes, after the first fumble, yeah, I wasn't worried about him at all. I, I right. really, Kareem Hunt was a guy, I just loved the Toledo. Um, and he went in the third round in the NFL draft, which is kind of crazy over some of these other guys. Um, but I was big on Hunt, just like the, like you're saying, the Andy Reid factor. Anytime we've seen Andy Reid with fancy running backs, He's proven that he's going to stick with them, Brian Westbrook. Uh-huh. You know, it's like, you know, if anyone remembers Brian Westbrook, he was a beast. Um, yeah. Especially fantasy-wise. My Jamal gosh. Charles. So going back to his tenure now in KC, Jamal Charles, um, you know, just kept on feeding the rock. Even Spencer Ware last year. Um, you know, yeah. so his track record has been proven. So I wasn't worried about Hunt whatsoever. And then, you know, about just KC is on a mission However, losing Eric Berry is kind of big now. He just, it was just, yeah. just enough that he's out for the season um, with yeah. an Achilles. Tank. So um, it's a big blow for them um, on their outlook season long overall. Um, but I love Kareem Hunt, and, you know, people should have been taking in Kareem Hunt um, as early as the third round. So, but New England, let's talk about the New England side of things. Danny Amendola uh-huh. left the game discussion. He had 100 yards for six, seven catches. Um, Brandon Cooks had three catches, 88 yards. And then Gronkowski didn't do too much. The I think he had two for 33, I believe, right? Gronkowski? Yep, yeah, two for 33. Um, 
my outlook on New England though is that I mean it's only week one, and and right. all the things I say is just guys, it's just week one. Um, there are 15 more weeks in the season for most of you guys. For people who play week 17, I don't know why. Um, but for most of you, there's 15 more weeks left after this week, and we need to. Everybody needs to be easy and humble about their expectations uh, for some people. Um, but we'll talk about the England side. Um, I think what scares me um, was not the Mike Gillisley touchdowns because I was gung ho about Gillisley, even though with all these New England pieces. Um, could that change week to week? Yes. Um, but I'm more scared about people who drafted Brandon Cooks, especially on a PPR first round um, or, you know, second round for most. But I'm worried because Brady threw for 16 and 36, um, and Cooks only had three catches for 88 yards. Um, uh-huh. And most of that came in the first half. Um, right. what, my concern, what my concern is that, not only does, you know, because people have New England, New England, you know, besides week one, I mean, you know, people had New England still high um, as far as winning a lot of games and literally, you know, having, you know, fit the mold of that game script, script of them being up by 27 points. And that still, you know, sustains, you know, granted New England may have to change some things defensively and all this type of stuff and what could it make an outlook for Brandon Cooks. But having said that, I think what I'm concerned about is that Cooks not being involved enough even with all the receivers going down, it, that's why I didn't draft him in any of my leagues because I was a little bit concerned mm-hmm. on what his outlook could be week to week. Now, with Mike Gillisley, yeah, that could be a little bit of a, an issue of, yeah, other guys could get, you know, put their hands in the cookie jar. Um, right. We saw that with their first couple of drives. I mean, he didn't even start the game. It was um, – Right. Rex Burkhead started. So then you had James White coming in, you know, in and out too. So – but I wasn't concerned about because we all know Gillespie was going to play the goal line back. Some people were like, oh, we're too scared on Gillespie. We have no idea what's going to, New England's going to happen, which is still true. But at least for week one, I am right about Gillespie. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I, I know and I, I, I hear your temperament as far as the worry on Cooks a little bit just because of the distribution from last night. But Patriots at least get a break next week. Uh, they're going into New England. I mean, not New England. I'm sorry, New Orleans. They're going into the Dome. It's a comeback game for Brandon Cooks. Uh, I expect Brandon Cooks to have a really, really good game next week, and especially Tom Brady as well against a, a, a somewhat weak Saints uh, secondary. And if they're going to get any of the kinks out, they have to do it because those next three weeks after that, they're facing the Texans, the Panthers, and the Buccaneers. Which all have three. These three of those uh, are stout defenses. So if they're gonna work anything out or get, you know, kind of get back in the groove of things, it has to be next week against the Saints. I think no doubt New England's gonna be. Uh, I mean, we all know Belichick. Um, <laughs> he'll be out for blood, even against his boy Shane Pay- Sean Payton. Um, he's gonna look to get at least forty something points back <laughs> uh, after, you know. 42 points were the most points scored on a Belichick defense in his whole era of the New England uh, franchise. Uh-huh. So I'm sure we're going to look for them to at least get 70 points, 80. <laughs> um, so yeah, I definitely, definitely believe in a Brandon Cooks bounce back, um, you know, for sure. Um, but, yeah, I mean, still, week one did kind of scare me, spooked me a little bit about Brandon Cooks, but – we're going to move on. We're going to talk about positions and some guys we think that you should definitely start, some guys you should uh-huh. sit, some guys you should definitely pick up off the waiver wire this week. So we'll kick it off with our quarterbacks, and we will start by naming three guys you guys should start, three guys you should sit. Corey, I will let you go first. All right. Well, let's go quarterbacks, actually. Like you were saying, let's go quarterbacks. Uh, as far as starts and sticks, I'm definitely, definitely, I mean, this is probably the most obvious one, <laughs> is Aaron Rodgers, even against Seattle. Because yeah, I know, and that's why I went Aaron Rodgers, because I know some people would still be like, uh, it's still Seattle. Seattle's, it's Aaron Rodgers at home in week one with no injuries to anybody. He's got all of his weapons right now. I'm playing Aaron Rodgers, period. Who are you going? Who are you? Who's your first one? Uh, first guy you got to start. Um, you know, A. Rod. Obviously, he's at home. Like right. you say, 
against Seattle, Richard Sherman, all that. I mean, you could get a little scared. You could get a little spooked. I mean, they picked up Sheldon Richardson. That's all I'm going to say. And um, But I do love Aaron Rodgers at home. You don't go against really a Rod at home. And for all the guys that play daily fantasy, um, you know, A-Rod probably going to be the cheapest. You'll probably get him all season long in this right. matchup. For mm-hmm. at least three game so um that's a good pick but my guy um you know that um could definitely be a start week one um is Kirk Cousins and because um mm-hmm. I, I believe I believe the the Eagles and the Redskins are going to get into a nice little shootout this week and if that comes to fruition then Kirk Cousins is definitely a start for me um Kirk Cousins has done more with less and um you know for the, all the Redskins fans listening to this um, I'm not really concerned about Kirk Cousins uh, having a, a, a dread, uh, you know, a down year. Um, you got a guy like Terrell Pryor who's done more with less again. Um, he gets to upgrade a quarterback. Um, you got Chris Thompson who could pa- catch the ball at the backfield. I mean, I'm mm-hmm. I'm, just, I'm not a guy for Rob Kelly, but um, <laughs> he's well, just not a guy for me. But I hate I, to interrupt you, bro, but we got breaking news just now. And this is very, very important fantasy wise. Uh, Ezekiel Elliott has won the injunction from the Texas court. So the NFL is barred from imposing the suspension for the duration of the lawsuit, which is probably going to be all season. Wow. That's just come out. So if wow. you have Ezekiel Elliott, <laughs> get him in your lineup because he's, wow. <laughs> he's playing, which, which, which what would seem to be all season. So wow. if you took that chance and got him on a late round steal, third round, fourth round, and even in some cases, congratulate yourself, pat yourself on the back, because you got one right there. We'll talk about Ezekiel Elliott. I think, <laughs> playing, I think I'll be playing devil's advocate on that one. Um, but okay. that is, Fair enough. That's, that's huge news. We'll get to that when we talk about the running backs. Um but talking about Kirk Cousins, I mean, this guy is literally, like, proven that he's in the next echelon of these guys for mm-hmm. fantasy. Um, he's proven that he could, you know, go for at least 4,000 yards the last couple of seasons, even on one-year deals. And um, the yeah, NFC is going to be one of the divisions where, you know, he's going to constantly be able to throw the ball, um, you know, constantly against defenses that are not exactly subpar. I'm not going to say they're subpar. But they're right. defenses that have a lot of yardage. Um and their they're, they're defense, the division is known to let up a lot of shootouts. So I'm not expecting, I'm, I'm definitely not, definitely expecting a shootout, I should say, um, with Kirk Cousins here, along with, along with Carson Wentz. I think he's also startable. I think both those guys are definitely startable in a game where both of these, where, where the point spread, I believe, is right now, like, you know, close to 50, I think, um, for total. Um, so I definitely like Kirk Cousins there. Another, a guy you would sit right now, a guy you're not so gung ho about week one. Hmm. It's a couple of them. It's a couple of them. But I think the first one that I would probably say in week one, as far as like a quarterback, because I'm always iffy on week one only because it's it's the proving ground for everybody. Anything can happen happen week one. Right. (laughs) But uh, honestly, and you hear me out. I, I'm I'm going to say Dak Prescott, man. And the reason why I'm so – I'm not too, too high on that is because it, I just remember last year, as far as the production with Dez, and it, 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 it was flashes there towards the end. But I have to see <laughs> this first week out of Dak Prescott before, especially with a division rival coming into town with the Giants. I don't think that's going to be too high scoring of a game. And I think they really, really, with, especially with this Zeke news coming out now, I think we get a whole healthy heap and dosage of, of Zeke Elliott. I would have to agree with you saying Prescott. I mean, to me, Prescott was, a, you know, he's a, he's a quarterback where um, he was able to find himself last year. Um, but they didn't exactly expand the playbook for him so much. Um, but in a division game where I I I just think this this Sunday night football game, which is kinda huge already, um mm-hmm. Zeke Zeke now being able to play fully, um, 
I don't think it changes. I, I just don't. He was going to play week one anyway. I just don't think it changes up the game script for him. Um, he's definitely, to me, he's one of those guys I'm definitely on the fringe about of starting. But I can definitely mm-hmm. see people sit sure, um, and going out to get somebody else. But a guy who I'm not so gung ho about, week one, Philip Rivers of the of the L.A. Chargers. Mm-hmm. Uh, I almost said San Diego. Uh, <laughs> Make sure you get that right. <laughs> um, uh, you know, going away to Denver where it's one of those no-fly zone defenses. Um, Phil Rivers definitely got some weapons back. Um, and I just think it's going to be one of those games where Denver's going to come out and punch someone in the mouth, um, whoever it was going to be. And unfortunately, it's going to be the LA Chargers. Um, right. Phil Rivers has been prone to throw interceptions against the Denver Broncos. He doesn't do very well overall against the Denver Broncos team. Um, and the Denver Broncos have had the Phil Rivers number over the last few years. It's the reason why he hasn't mm-hmm. gotten to the play. Um, so I believe I'm just I'm definitely if I have River I'm definitely sitting him this week. Um mm-hmm. and I'm trying to see if, you know, um there's someone else on a waiver where I could possibly just plug and play. Um right. another guy another guy that's startable in my opinion. Um and he's, some people have been like, you know, just standing the third about him. And if you have him in a deeper format, you just gotta start him. And that's Andy Dole in the Cincinnati Bengals. Um, yeah. Dolan has too many, Dolan has too many weapons around him to not start him. I mean, if you have someone else, yeah, sure, why not? Um, but Andy Dolan to me is still one of those guys where he went very re- real late in drafts, in my opinion. Um, he wasn't going that he was going that range of like Tyrod Taylor and Carson Wentz in that era in that area, and you know that's like I would say like tenth, eleventh roundish um, in some leagues, and that was just just too low for a guy who has AJ Green when healthy. Tyler Eifert, when he comes back, I'm sorry, when, I'm sorry, he is back. When he's healthy, he'll be able to perform. Um, you know, offensive line, yes, it looks shaky, um, but in a right situ- situation, has a decent run game. Um, and Dalton, Dalton loves to play action passes. And when those play action passes come, look for some shots down the field. Um, it's going to happen. John Ross coming over. Mm-hmm. Back, I mean, you know, you got guys in that offense that, I think just Dalton has a lot of weapons to play with now. And, you know, dating back to when Carson Palmer used to play, the DJ Who's Your Mama days. Um, <laughs> yeah. I, think I think this I think this is the offense that um I think that's like, you know, can definitely be one. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, I guess the other quarterback I was going to mention, one of the other quarterbacks I was going to mention, you had already mentioned it, was Carson Wentz. And I'm not saying that because I'm a homer, because I'm an Eagles fan. But I just really feel as though Carson Wentz is going to have so much fun. You can't make all me of these want what I don't want. You can't dangle something. Oh, are you there? Yep. Okay. Um, we'll have to edit that out. But uh, going back to my saying about Doll, he has too many weapons around him to uh, – mm-hmm. uh, to literally like um not not be able to be startable. Um like I said, this is for guys who are probably in more deeper leagues and like kind of making decisions on it. do I start Dalton or is it someone else in the waiver I'd go pick up? Um Dalton to me you just start him with confidence. The Baltimore Ravens defense for me has declined over the last two years. Um so I think Dalton will be able to pick him apart a little bit and expose them. Another oh, guy Oh yeah absolutely Yeah absolutely another guy you are excited about starting this week. Uh, you had already mentioned them, actually. It's Carson Wentz. And I'm not just saying that because I'm a homer, because I'm an Eagles fan. I'm, I'm not just saying it because of that. The actual reason I'm saying because of that is because he's going to have the absolute time of his life with all of these new toys that he has in the offense. And he's going to spread the ball around. He is going to have – he's going to have people open. And it's going to be – you know, a situation where you've got Alshon Jeffrey covered probably by Josh Norman in most situations. He's going to have so many other options now to go to, and I just don't see that Washington secondary completely handling the Eagles' offense. And Carson Wentz is somebody who's going to get into a shootout with Kirk Cousins. I definitely see, like you said earlier, at least, even though it's a a, a, um, division game, I see at least 50 points combined, at least. 
I agree. I mean, it's just one of those games where you're just going to be uh, in a shootout where, yeah, I mean, but especially for those DFS guys out there, definitely start wins. Um, he'll be like probably like less than 10% owned. Um, <laughs> you know, Ryan, <laughs> I was going to say, hey, Rod, you can play Carson Wentz and just and fit in all the studs. Um, <laughs> so this will be one of those type of games. Um, you know, so also, um, I was, um, okay. So name, name a guy that you are, you know, not starting for sure. Um, Oof. for sure, for sure. Sure, sure. Not starting whatsoever. <laughs> Trevor Simeon. <laughs> <laughs> and, and the reason why I say that, because even though, and like you mentioned earlier with Philip Rivers, even though he's yeah he's playing a stout Denver defense, but let's not forget, I want to say the Chargers put up maybe somewhere either four, five, or six defensive touchdowns last year. I want to say the Chargers were maybe top five or top ten in defenses last year, fantasy wise. Top, that is, they were they were top ten defensively. Yes. Uh, yeah. Okay. So, and and most of those pieces, if I'm not mistaken, have come back. So I look for Trevor Simeon to be shaky, which will automatically start up the quarterback controversy, which I think as soon as Brock gets his feet back under him, I think Brock Osweiler will end up being the starter in Denver again. But for now, yeah, absolutely not playing Trevor Simeon whatsoever. I'd play Blake Bortles over Trevor Simeon. Sorry, I just would. <laughs> um. That's it. Yeah, I would. I would definitely. <laughs> um, there's a guy, and then name your last starter, and then I'll name my last start instead before we move on to missed, uh, next rankings. Okay. Well, my last starter is. I would have to say it's probably going to be. Probably going to have to go with, and it, it sounds weird, but Tyrod Taylor. The Jets are awful. The Jets will probably be one of the worst teams in NFL history. (laughs) And it's a division game. But Tyrod Taylor, he's been cleared. I think Buffalo's not even that good either. But I think Tyrod has a great game against the Jets. The Jets just aren't good. And they just released Calvin Pryor, who was picked up by the Jaguars. The situation is only getting worse for the Jets. I... I don't even – I'll put it this way. This is how bad I think the Jets are. I'm almost considering in a survivor league every week that I can, I'm going to pick the opponent that's playing the Jets <laughs> until it's somebody who I've already repeated. That's how bad they are. So, yeah, I'm absolutely – I'm playing uh, Tyrod Taylor this week against the Jets. Hey man, I can't knock that. I'm a Jets fan. Um, <laughs> oh, whoops. <laughs> so, uh, okay. Um, we know we're gonna suck. Um, it's all right. But um, I don't mind that at all. Tyrod Taylor has a he's a dual threat type of quarterback. Mm-hmm. Rubbing his legs. Um, you know, and against the Jets team, you know, we just don't know. It's just a bunch of unknowns for the Jets this year. I'm not saying that they they're gonna be all the way suck, but uh, there's no expectations for them. And if you play for the Jets. Hey, no expectation that you play in New York. Hey, why not? It's just the Mets. Of <laughs> it's like the Mets of football almost. Um, but um, a guy that's intriguing and a guy that I will be sitting. I like him, but I'll be sitting him this week. Sean Kaiser of the Cleveland Browns. Only not because he plays for the Browns. They kind right. of like great talent. But Pittsburgh, getting Joe Hayden is huge. Um, Absolutely. Joe Hayden is huge for that Pittsburgh defense. Um, and hopefully Joe Hayden can stay healthy for that Pittsburgh defense, but Pittsburgh defense week one is tough, especially for any, uh-huh. rookie, uh, for any rookie quarterback, especially, uh, but for Sean Kaiser at his first test, he hopefully, uh, doesn't, uh, if you have this shot to Sean Kaiser, like a two QB league, it's tough. Um, I just recommend you not do that. My last starter, um, and, uh, we'll move on. I mean, obviously, it's Cam Newton of the Carolina Panthers. I mean, people are concerned about Cam Newton right now because of him coming off the surgery and everything, and he only threw two passes in the preseason. Um, but I would say this. Don't worry about Cam Newton. Start him with confidence against the San Francisco 49ers, and, 
expect him to do good things. <laughs> um, right. You know I'm saying expect him to at least throw for two touchdowns and close to 300 yards. Um, you know, just because I just want to see how the offense does for Cam, like around him for Cam Newton. Is it going to be one of those situations where he's going to just let the game flow happen, which would be Jonathan Stewart running the ball, um, or would it be more of him just able to get some quick passes out like he was starting to do um, in the preseason? So, I mean, we'll see. But I, lo- I still love Cam Newton, as, and you should definitely start him um, if you drafted him. I still think he's he's going to be better, better, as long as everybody around him, like, as long as the offensive line stays healthy, I think Cam Newton is still out for a break of the year. Absolutely. I absolutely agree. He's uh, he's still Cam Newton. As simple as that sounds, he's still Cam Newton. Even last year, I, he, I'm sorry, he's just one of those guys who I consider in that realm of you start him no matter what. I mean, unless they were playing Denver last year, I would <laughs> start. He's one of the guys I would start no matter what. I would. I mean, he's just – He's Cam Newton. He's too much of a dual threat, even though there's a possibility he's not going to be running as much this year. He's still in that next tier of quarterbacks after the elites, in my opinion. So you start them. You just do. I agree. Um, you, just, you just have to. So moving on to running backs, we're going to name a couple of guys to where we're going to start sit. Um, mm-hmm. Guys not naming, Bell. Johnson, McCoy, right. C. Elliott, <laughs> and Devontae Freeman. Give me two guys that you're starting this week and why. Oh, well, the first one, this one, this one is biased because I'm hoping, and it's not the not an Eagles running back, oh, but I'm Blanche, hoping. Blanche, please don't say LeGarrette Blunt. No, no, I won't. I promise you I won't. I'm biased because I drafted him in a couple of leagues because I'm hoping he bounces back this year. It's Todd Gurley. I, I think he has a good matchup against Indianapolis, and I feel as though this may be his bounce back year. He's a young, he's young. He had he had a horrible, horrible year last year. Cost me a couple of leagues last year actually because I drafted him so high. But uh, I think he bounces back this year, and he's a guy I'm definitely starting this week. I mean, I agree with you, man. I mean, <laughs> I can't, I can't not what you just said, man, for sure. Um, yeah. Name your other starter this week. Oh, the other one who I really think is going to have a, a good game as well, even if it's against the Broncos, it's uh, Melvin Gordon. I just feel as though he found his niche last year and it's going to continue. He's going to be a top running back fantasy wise this year. And I think it starts with the Broncos. I think because of what you said earlier, with Philip Rivers playing against that Broncos secondary, I think they hand it off and, and feed Melvin Gordon a pretty substantial amount of touches. So I think Melvin Gordon's the other one I would definitely have on my starting radar for this week. That's okay. I, we gotta we gotta talk about Melvin Gordon. Um, okay, he's one of my sitters this week. Um, okay. That's like, just like, I'm just, uh, as people could probably tell, this is probably starting to come into a little bit of a trend here for LA. Um, but I don't <laughs> think Melvin Gordon is startable this week because, yes, we drafted him as a top 10 running back, of course. And yes, right. he, you know, he was decent last year for sure. Just playing the Denver Broncos, man, I just don't like the matchup. Um, okay. like I, did for Phil Rivers, I don't like the matchup. I don't like the matchup for Melvin Gordon. Will he be, you know, at least startable? Sure. But will be a guy that I want to start? No. Um, so he's one of my sits this week. A guy that I'm looking to start for sure um, is Jordan Howard against Atlanta. Um, Atlanta is mm. going to be, you know, their defense has improved and stuff. Um, and, yes, they have something to prove after, after coming off the 28-3. and three. Um, But I think um, you got to start Jordan Howard. Game script may fall away from him. But in a PPR format, he's still going to get touches. He's mm-hmm. still going to get the backfield. Even in standard league, he still get, should get a, a touchdown or two. And you should still be satisfied with Jordan Howard, if, you know, especially if he's your RB2. If he's your RB1, then okay. But um, 
guy is kind of on the fence because you know Atlanta could go up like twenty one nothing early. <laughs> you know, Man, Howard, if, if, if Jordan Howard's your RB two, I want to know what was going on in that draft because Jordan Howard was you know he's like a, he was projected to be a top ten uh, running back. Man, that, that, it was just funny when you said that. Just like I'm like, woo, RB two, and I will say. It would not surprise me because there are leagues out there that, you know, you have people, you have leagues that aren't pretty much as cut and dry as it may seem. And you have people where you have leagues that have four and five quarterbacks going in the first round. So Jordan Howard being an RB2, as 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 weird as it sounds, it's not unrealistic. I mean, for some leagues, I mean, it's all about based on your draft strategy. Um, we'll talk about, you know, draft strategy and stuff like that. But in a, in a scenario where some people have double picks, some people have picks late in the first round and early second, um, that's the territory where I saw Jordan Howard going um, in some cases. So if he's your RB2, you just feel great um, overall about your team. Um, right. Hopefully not, hopefully not playing no week, no 18, 10 team stuff. Uh, <laughs> we're talking about 12 right. people. Um, what I'm saying is that um, for um, sorry Jordan Howard, his expectation is that Atlanta's going to go up big and then he may fall out of game script. But in PPR formats, especially, I, I love Jordan Howard. Um, you know, overall too as well. Um, another guy that um, I am, you know, he was on my sit list already. I was going to be a Jay Ajahi, but Tampa Bay and Miami are not playing, mm-hmm. so uh, somewhere else. <laughs> yes. guy, yeah, yeah. One guy for me that I'm just gonna be um that I'm just gonna be sitting. Um and it's just he may not be a guy where okay, like you know, this has been the third, whatever, but um is Isaiah Crowell. Um mm. I like yeah. another guy that I like overall. But I had to sit him because he's playing the the narrative, he's playing Pittsburgh. Could he get a touchdown or two? Yes. But he's shaky at the end of the day. And if you drafted him as like your, you know, some people draft him as an RB one and some a bunch of these Yahoo mm-hmm. RB one. Um, if he's your RB one this week, then that's kind of tough in my opinion. Um, right. The other guy that I'll be well not sitting but starting in this case, and this has been kind of debatable in a sense for some people. Like we'll say this and then say that. Um, Obviously, it was going to be Kareem Hunt, but uh, we didn't get to that in time. But he's obviously a stud. Um, but a guy yep. that I was going to start um, as an RB2 is Jonathan Stewart of the Carolina Panthers because, simply put, game script, game script, game script is in his favor. Mm-hmm. Okay. Against, against uh, San Francisco, right? Yes, sir. Against yeah, San Francisco. That, that may – we may have the – you know what? I think I'm going to agree with you. We may have to wait on the Christian McCaffrey show a little bit. I think that just tailors that type of game of what that may be tailors to a Jonathan Stewart. So I, I, I think I can agree with you on that. But um, I definitely agree with what you were just saying because Jonathan Stewart, it's just game script. I mean, that's just pretty much that. Mm-hmm. Uh, Christian, McCaffrey, Christian McCaffrey, I mean, I got a question earlier when I was on um, Periscope and people asked me about McCaffrey and I was like, look, Jonathan Stewart's going to be the first and second down back and McCaffrey's going to be the third down back. Will that change? It definitely can. This is the NFL season. Jonathan Stewart can get hurt first play. Um, <laughs> and yeah. Then all of a sudden, all, yeah. And then what I just said goes out the window. So, um, right. It, it's, uh, it's one of those things where, you know, just Jonathan Stewart's going to have the first, second down roll and we'll mostly have the goal line works in that game. So, I'm guessing Jonathan Stewart, you know, could you could definitely pop into your RB two spot. Heck, flex play. Um, yeah. For sure. Your guys that you are sitting. Ooh. Okay. Well, <laughs> at least for until it's cleared up on who's going to be the actual running back, I'll give you two: Jeremy Hill and Joe Mixon. Unless you really drafted Joe Mixon as your the only possible flex guy or your RB two. That counts as a combination. You gotta give us yeah. one more fact. You, you say one more? Give you, you one more? Say, you can't say Giovanni Bernard. 
<laughs> the, you know what? Honestly, I'm going to say uh, probably Amir Abdullah. Because the Lions why are, you, are playing. Why, why are you saying, why Why should we be steering away from the Bengals uh, back to Okay, turn? okay, I'll go, I'll go to that. I, it, like I just said, it's it's just that it's unclear right now. And I feel like at least for week one, they're going to really be splitting those carries almost down the middle. Uh, well, well, actually three ways. I don't think Giovanni Bernard is as much of a factor as Mixon and uh, Hill. But Hill and Hill and Mixon will see almost probably the same share of snaps unless something happens with one or the other to where somebody's clearly outperforming the other. Then at least you'll know going on who to play. But because it's so murky with who to play right now, I'm definitely going to say those two, if you have one of those starting, if you can plug somebody else in, I'd do it. That's interesting because I am with you about Joe Mixon of the equation. Mm-hmm. Jeremy Hill, if you have to start Jeremy Hill, if you have to, if you're in a if you're in a situation, sticky situation, like I said, deeper format, mm-hmm. you know, I'll start Jeremy Hill and hope that he gets me a touchdown in a scenario in a game where I think uh, it could be pretty close. Um, and yeah, yeah, you're right. The situation is murky. But I could definitely see myself starting Jeremy Hill if I was in a deeper format and hoping for mm-hmm. it to get on or hoping that he at least gets the goal line work in the early on. I love Joe Mixon's outlook. Um, yeah, uh, for the future, talent, absolutely. His talent is just like, it's just, you know, it, it's, you know, there's a reason why they went up in the second round and grabbed him. Um, so I like his outlook overall. Um but yeah, not this week against you know Baltimore for sure. I just don't like that situation for sure. But if you have to start Jeremy Hill, uh, I could take a gamble on him getting a you know goal line couple of touches here and there. Um, why? So why are you saying Amir Abdullah? Um, my my thing for Amir Abdullah is that I just don't think he's that guy for Detroit. You know, for Detroit, they're a pass happy offense. They're gonna be passing the ball a lot, and I just don't see scenarios where Amir Abdullah. Unless he like runs, you know, unless he gets like a couple of long touchdown runs, um, really like take hold of that running back position. Why are you so? Why are you low on Amir Abdullah? That was my- well, he just took the words out of my mouth. I think it's going to be a situation where the Lions are just going to be in a passing type of situation against Arizona. I think they, I think they hang with Arizona, but they're going to have to put the ball in the air, and Theo Riddick's just going to be their pass catching back. And with that being said, if Theo Riddick's the one catching passes, and if Matt Stafford is the one that's throwing them, I'm going with I'm going with Theo Theo Riddick. I agree. Um, name a guy who you are starting, and he literally um, he's in a situation you think is that it's not just murky, but you think it's it's not exactly a, a great position to be in. So my guys in that tier would be, you know, like your Garrett Blunt, your Derrick Henrys if you had to start them, your Lacey from Seattle, um, these type of guys in that range. Like, who would you well, put? Well, Lacey was going to be the one I said, but if Thomas Rawls can't go, we're going to see the Eddie Lacey show going into Green Bay, well, especially with him with it being a, go- a comeback game. I mean, if if Rawls can't go, I see Lacey easily getting 20 carries. Easily. Lacey would have been somebody I would have named. But Garrett Blunt also would have been somebody I would have named. And the reason why is because, you know, I follow Philly. I think they really have something special with Corey Clement. I really do. Donnell Pumphrey is going to be the next Darren Sproles for us, pretty much. But Clement, I think, in the long run, if Garrett Blunt really isn't shaping up, I think Corey Clement may, you know, surpass Wendell Smallwood in the depth chart, and I would say Corey Clement could end up being the guy in Philly. I'm not saying to rush out there and grab him and stash him, but two, three games going in, if you're not really seeing the production out of Garrett Blunt that you think you would, I mean, it would go to Wendell Smallwood, 
after that, but Corey Clement, I really think is something special. So, absolutely, I think Legarrette Blunt's one of those murky ones as well. But I think that th- there's a there's a diamond in the rough waiting if if the opportunity pre- presents itself. Here's the thing, a uh, guy who I think either I think people are forgetting about, or uh, is just maybe just forced to, not exactly forced to play, but is flex worthy. And as Danny Wood at the Baltimore Ravens, um, mm-hmm. it proven, you know, even PPR or not, yes, normally PPR format, he'd be, oh, he'd be great. But even if you're, if, even if you may even question the starting match standard, um, if you're in that type of situation, I'm, I'm, I'll start Danny Woodhead because in his stops in New England, his stops in San Diego, his stop now, well, it used to be San Diego, now it's L.A., um, there were there are times Woodhead, Woodhead would catch the ball in the backfield, of course, and look like that shifty guy. Sorry, New York Jets too. That's where we had him first. Mm-hmm. <laughs> now mm-hmm. he he was he'd be getting all these goal line touches now. Um, so in the situations where you know ball, you know Baltimore, yes, yeah, Terrence West can be a factor, but he's he's proven to be a guy that's easily replaceable. Danny Woodhead, when healthy, is going to catch the ball at the backfield. Um, but he's also going to be getting some goal line touches if history repeats itself, which I think it will, because Flacco loves to check down to his running backs. Um, let's go back to the Ray Rice days, and um, you know that he's proven Flacco has proven to be that type of quarterback. Um, so if you're in a situation where you got to start um, someone at the flex and look for someone to get to some touchdown upside, Danny Woodhead might be your guy. Yeah, that, that's interesting that you say that because. You would you would think uh, with Danny Woodhead, you you obviously know the production that you could be getting out of him, but you you still got a fear for some reason. I just really feel they're still going to try and make sure Terrence West is involved somehow. I, I don't think it's going to be the Danny Woodhead show as much as it's perceived to be in a lot of places. I do think Terrence West gets the bulk of the, you know, the heavy workload, it'll be close. I'm almost thinking like like a, a 55-45% or a 60-40, something like that. But I do think Terrence West is still kind of the the the, the dirty work guy, I guess you could say. Yeah, it makes sense. It makes sense. I mean, it is. Like I'm saying, I didn't say they would have probably would get the whole – the whole show handed to him. Yes, Terrence West going to find himself getting some carries in between. We'll see what happens after week one, but I'm, if you're still thinking about a guy like, you know, who needs to be probably a flex consideration, Woodhead's there. Um, going to receivers, um, we will not talk about we'll, – we'll talk we'll, we'll talk about this guy. Um, is OBJ of the mm-hmm. New York um, – you know – Reports came out that he's going to be questionable for the game. And, um, you know, my thoughts for this, this OBJ is that, um, you know, it's going to be a Sunday night football game. Which takes a month. You know, you don't know, which is kind of scary. Because we, we all know with late games that it's tougher. You know, you got to make decisions for 1 o'clock in a sense in most, in most you know, formats and stuff like that. Unless you have a guy you can replace OBJ, like for Monday night, for instance, you're caught in a pickle. Um, we won't know if OBJ is active until probably like five months. So it puts owners in a pickle. Um, am I starting him if he's active? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. He's he's Odell Beckham Jr. Odell you're Odell Beckham starting Jr. Him. You are starting you're starting him, him if he's but I am very nervous about him. I'll just say that. I'll just say that. I'm very nervous about OBJ. He and if you're in a situation where you got a lot of receivers and you're more confident, some guy on Monday night. I mean, I'm not sure because it's one of those things where, yes, it's week one, um, but you don't and you and I'm and I'm not a firm believer always starting your stud, um, but I think with that high ankle sprain can definitely linger on. And we're not sure if he's going to be if he, even if he's made active. We don't know if he's going to be 100. percent So having said that, if I got a guy who you know, for example, if you went 
if you got if your first four or five picks, you were able to get the receivers who were unified after OBJ. Um, like a Martavis Bryant maybe fell to you, a Stephon Diggs maybe fell to you. I'm more likely to start them in a flex spot if I have the depth over OBJ right now because I don't know what his angle situation is um, regardless. And, and we probably won't know until, like I said, after lock. So, yeah, start your starters, sure, but I'm just very I'm just very weary about OBJ right now. Um, okay. And I give a bump up to Brandon Marshall and Sterling Shepard right now. That's what I was going to say. If Brandon Marshall probably isn't out there in most leagues, but Sterling Shepard might be. And if you really, if all of your people are playing at one o'clock, and you're just, and I'm, in, and I'm not gonna lie, I'm in one of those situations in one of my leagues. I have Odell Beckham, and my other receivers. I mean, they're good, but I wouldn't want to play play them over Odell, and then Odell plays. Saying that, if you have the room to maybe drop somebody and pick up a Sterling Shepard as a as security, then go ahead and do that and get Sterling Shepard because at least you'll have somebody that you can plug in at eight o'clock if Odell Beckham can't play. Some points is better than no points. And if you're not confident in somebody else that you have on your bench, you might as well go ahead and stash Sterling Shepard. You know he's gonna his target share is gonna go up if Odell Beckham's out. So that that's where I stand with that. I think that's what you just what you just said was beautiful. Um, Sterling Shepard's still out there. I think um, he's definitely worth grabbing, um, especially with, depending on what league you're in. He might be out there. Um, check your waiver wires. Um, but I think just that, that being said, I think we had to address that situation. Um, guys besides AB, Julio, AJ, Green that I'm starting, um, is Doug Baldwin, Seattle Seahawks. Just like we said at the top about A-Rod, um, Russell Wilson is not too far behind. Um, when we're talking about quarterbacks in the next, in that first tier, um, people, it's an argument that you know, Wilson is not a top five quarterback for the XYZ. But Doug Baldwin is really coming together on his own, and I can't – Green Bay, for me, they're secondary. I still see anyone really matching up with Baldwin like that, if you ask me. Um, mm-hmm. I've seen Baldwin literally, like, skyrocket second half. He's more of a second-half guy. Um, but I think he's due for – he's going to have a, a big game, this game against Green Bay. Um, mm-hmm. It's a situation where Seattle has to throw the ball to come back from behind. Um and then game script's going to fall out of the hands of the late, a Lacey, wherever you guys start to see how backfield. But I think uh, Baldwin's going to be, I think he's a top seven receiver this week. Um, and he's due for a big game. Yeah, somebody else that I would say start in your leagues and take him as a flyer. And he may be available too if Odell Beckham is not able to go. Ted Ginn Jr. for the Saints. I mean, you got to figure. He's going to go down the field so many times, and he's going to get looks down the field. He's bound to catch one of them. That's usually exactly what happened with him in Carolina. Yeah, it's a it's a hit or miss with him, but it's like, boy, when he hits, he hits. So if you really, really, really can't get a Sterling Shepard, can't get a Brandon Marshall, Ted Ginn might be out there. So I would take a chance on him. I have that one. Um, but I'll go a step further with Ted Ginn. And that we all know Willie Sneed, Sneed suspended for the first three games of the season. Um, mm-hmm. how, how we all, I mean, at least I was wondering why Ted Ginn was the second receiver listed on the depth chart. And now we know why. Um, because Sneed would miss the first three games of the season. So Michael Thomas, the first receiver, Ted Ginn's the second. Um, I think Ted Ginn, at least for the next couple of weeks, is going to be one of those guys that's going to be at least flex-worthy to start for sure. Yeah. Um, mm-hmm. to the volume of that New Orleans offense. I mean, Ted, you know, getting a burner like Ted Ginn for New Orleans, where Drew Brees, we all know he's going to throw the ball down deep um, to guys when they're open. Uh, you know, Brandon Cooks last year, for instance. Um, could he be that guy? Absolutely. Um 
So that's what makes uh, Ted Ginn a little bit more dangerous. And looks, and I think he's being overlooked um, because of what he did in Carolina. Like, because before, I th- maybe he could be that receiver that can definitely be, you know, consistent, at least for the first couple of weeks, and not look like the guy that looked like in Carolina where he'd be a boom or bust. Um, you know, guys I put in that boom or bust category like Deshaun Jackson, him, right. Corey Smith. Um, so, like, those guys – fall on that tier, but I think Ted Ginn can at least be consistent for the next couple of weeks, and he's definitely startable against Minnesota this week, but beware, Minnesota defense is just, whew, man, their secondary is like, you know, they're, they're top-notch. Um, yeah, they are. Defense, but I do like the Ted Ginn, uh, Ted Ginn um, mention. Another guy um, that I'm loving, not only just for today, but for all season long, Martavis Bryant of the Pittsburgh Steelers. Why? Tavis Bryant, he was suspended last year, um, and that means another year of legs. Um, 2015, Martavis Bryant scored 14 touchdowns. Um, for a guy that was going, some, in some of my drafts, he was going, you know, I, I pounced on him fourth round easily. Um, some guys, they were going like fifth round-ish, late fifth round. Um, you know, I just thought that was way too low for Martavis Bryant. Why? Right. You're playing an offense like Pittsburgh that's going to sling the ball, um, going to have a guy like Le'Veon Bell running, but Martavis Bryant is going to get his. And for guys that are – I mean, yes, Antonio Brown is the bona fide stud in the league uh, because of receiver. But Martavis – he's still – having Martavis Bryant there is going to open some things up that wasn't happening last year. Last year – I think you can attest to this. I think it was week three Mm -hmm. of the Eagles. There were times where, you know, Brown was all locked up and no, there was no one really be able to get the ball to at least downfield. They had to rely on Sammy Coates, had to rely on um, some of these other guys at receiver and it couldn't get it done. It really missed Martavis Bryant's, um, you know, presence. Now getting them back, I think Martavis Bryant is just definitely due. And dare I say, put him as a top 10 wide receiver at the end of the year. Um, but he has that potential for me. Um, and I just think overall, I think Brian can be that guy because of his six, four catch radius and his ability to have already done that before. Um, people will say he could be like Alan Robinson from that year as well, but I just disagree. Um, his footwork, his speed, um, and his big catch radius just all thumbs up for me. Yeah, no, absolutely. Uh, Montavious Bryant is somebody a lot of fantasy people were so glad to get back this year. And um, on that note, I'm going to go one more uh, wide receiver that's probably really going to be having a good time. And I'm going back to the same game, but uh, Stephon Diggs, like he's going to have a game. And you talk. We always talk. You know, a lot of people talk about how Sam Bradford's just dink and dunk. He's safe. But Stephon Diggs against that Saints secondary is going to have a ball. So, uh, yeah, I'm definitely playing. I mean, Adam filing too. But out of the two, I'm definitely playing Stephon Diggs. I can definitely um, A plus 100% agree with that because I've been studying Stephon Diggs all summer as well. Um, Mm -hmm. Stephon Diggs is just one of those guys where even when he was hurt last year, he would still be able to do things um, from that slot position. Bradford just loved him. Now, now, you know, being able to put him in the inside and the outside, um, when healthy, Stephon Diggs was, was, I believe he was averaging, in the games where he was healthy, he was averaging at least 16 points per game. Um, Yeah. Depending on your math, of course. Um, but he was definitely averaging 16 points per game, at least, when he was healthy. Um, so having said that, he definitely has – he's one of those guys at the end of the year we'll be talking about and be like, wow, we should have got Stephon Diggs in, like, the early third instead of the late fifth, early sixth. <laughs> um, you know, for that would that would be my take on that one. Guys who you think that are sitting um, my first that I'll be um, – that I just – I'm sitting because I want to see what happens. Um, and that's Allen Robinson. 
Um, if I have Allen Robinson in my league, um, I didn't have Allen Robinson in any of my leagues. I even had a keeper league where I had him because I took over for someone else's team, and I didn't keep him. Um, cause I just wasn't. I'm just not a believer in Allen Robinson anymore. The only reason why yeah. 2015 Allen Robinson got a lot of his longer touchdown passes because the Jacksonville Jaguars were down so late and pretty much taking advantage of garbage time. And that's why everyone loved the Jaguars that late in the season. Um, and that's why people were telling them 2016 was like the Jacksonville Jaguars year. Um, can Al Robinson bounce back to be in that wide receiver two discussion? Yeah. But I just don't love the matchup against Houston. Um, Houston defense, they have a great front seven. And in their secondary, their corners hold up, hold up people, uh, gaining back to last year. So I don't love Allen Robinson this week. Um, and I just want to see what happens if I have him on my roster. Maybe he does – maybe when he has a big week, I'll go trade him. Uh, for, but for now, though, I'm just not in love with him. And another guy I'll be sitting this week, um, I'm just not that big on him. And he's always – to me, he's always been a guy people love and I just hate. This is Emmanuel Sanders of the Denver Broncos. Um, going back to what you were saying about Trevor Simeon, um, I like Trevor Simeon for the ways of he'll get the ball to Demarius Thomas. But for Emmanuel Sanders, I think he'll suffer a little bit. Um, since Peyton Manning left, Emmanuel Sanders to me just hasn't even been in, in even in the the ballpark of being flex consideration like for me here and there. Yes, but. And the wide receiver, too, where he was being drafted at for some people in the, like, the late fourth round, I just thought that was way too high. Um, so those are my sits for the week. How about yourself? Oh, yeah. That, as far as sits for the week, one, it, it would have it been Allen, Allen Robinson, but I'll go a different route. Um, he's drafted as a wide receiver one for a lot of people. But oh, I know. With, no, with no quarterback? <laughs> T.Y. Hilton with no quarterback I I can't I can't trust T.Y. Hilton out there I would almost just because it's the backup quarterback it, I have this weird theory and hear me out I feel like second receivers do better with backup quarterbacks and I don't for the life of me I don't know why but I just feel that way I feel Dante Moncrief may have a better game than T.Y. Hilton. And, and call me crazy, but I'll go out on a limb and say that. I just think Moncrief may be, be the one ending up in the end zone from that receiving core rather than T.Y. I can't knock what you just said about T.Y. Hilton. I got him as a wide receiver, too, and that was for PPR formats. Um, mm-hmm. Definitely not dropping him in standard league. Um, so just based on your league is where you where you drafted him. Um, I still think people like myself have some hope for Ty, regardless mm-hmm. who, because he's a possession receiver, um, and he gets a lot of yards after the catch. So he's just like a round the fence, you know, that's here above below him. Um, so I would say that he um he definitely has. You know, we all know Ty has the talent, and I think a little people are obviously scared because Andrew Luck's not there. Um, uh-huh. I would agree with what you just said about QBs being, you know, second string QBs being, you know, more prone to target the other receivers in the tree. But I think T. Y. Hilton is still one of those guys where I'm gonna get T. Y. Hilton the ball. And he's gonna be able to make things on his own versus right. just able to just, you know, just not be a playmaker really with the ball. Um, Moncrief has proven to be very inconsistent, and he's proven to be a guy who can't exactly stay healthy either. Um, right. So, I, but getting a test against the LA Rams, we'll see how this goes. I don't mind. I don't mind that prediction at all for you to sit him. Um, but I still think if he's your wide receiver two, I wouldn't get too concerned. I would just like to see how it plays out. Uh, right. Your other guys we're sitting this week, and then we'll move. Uh, yeah, the other guy I'm sitting this week, and it, it, it's weird because he got a lot of buzz. Got a lot of buzz because he's virtually probably the only uh the only threat i guess you could say um but it's robbie anderson of the jets he's got he got a lot of buzz because he pretty much was kind of the only guy so a lot of people did pick him up because he's like if somebody somebody's got to get the ball thrown to them for the jets 
and mm-hmm. it's Robbie Anderson. But with the addition, I believe Jeremy Curley went back to y'all. I'm definitely not playing. I mean, I'm not. I'm not confident in any Jets receiver, but I'm not playing Robbie Anderson. I know a lot of people were probably looking at Robbie Anderson as kind of the target guy, considering he's the one that's been there all of the camps. You all just got Jeremy Curley back. He's probably the one that's more up to speed. I'm still not playing Robbie Anderson. Hey, I don't blame you. Those The, the, the guys who are most likely picking Jets receivers are probably picking late. Uh, no, I mean, sorry, not picking late, but are in deeper formats. Mm-hmm. Uh, I didn't mind the Robbie Anderson play until the Jets traded for Jermaine Curse. Not that Jermaine Curse is someone to be touted about. <laughs> mm-hmm. um, but I think Jermaine Curse can definitely find himself having a big role in that Jets offense. However, you see the Jets offense as. Right. <laughs> uh, I think um, Jermaine Curse can be a guy where we – talk about got undrafted and all of a sudden became high flex consideration was because he'll be getting the ball a lot in the Jets offense that will be behind in most games um, and will literally be a guy where, you know, he could possibly make a difference in a sense, but obviously that probably not too much of a difference, but he'll be a guy that gets the volume and probably not Robbie Anderson. Um, I want to put my special bonus out there, um, but he just comes to mind now um, for a guy that definitely start and I've been big on him since since the off season started when he arrived and that's Pierre Garcon of the San Francisco 49ers because Garcon has proven that he could be a thousand yard thousand yard receiver um did it in Indianapolis did it in Washington now he's in San Francisco um with Kyle Shanahan and he's the number one receiver um P, uh, Brian Hoyer is no one to tout about um you know, but Ryan Hoyer, he's not going to be winning San Francisco a lot of games, I don't think. Um, but I think Pierre Garcon will still get a lot of volume. He's one of those guys where you get later, where you where you got later in your drafts, and you were confident in him because he's a number one receiver. Um, he's probably most likely your third I, for some of my leagues that I got him in. He is my fourth um, because I went receiver early. Um, so he was a guy that I just snagged because I I love guys who are – in, in situations like the Jets, but who are the number one receivers that can still get a lot of volume. Um, those are, especially with, if you were picking late in your draft, you're like, who's really there who get a lot of volume? That's not a running back. Um, Pierre Garcon was my guy. So um, I'm touting him against Carolina um, in hopes that he'll, you know, he'll break out. Carolina is a secondary I've been concerned about since this, the offseason started. Um, and, you know, I just I'm just not sold on that secondary just yet. Um we'll move on to tight end now. Um name one guy that you're starting, one guy you're sitting, uh, because obviously tight end is not deep. Um I'm starting Zach Ertz. I'm wow. sorry. Yeah, wow. starting Zach Ertz. Wow. Jordan Matthews <laughs> is not there. Alshon will be tied up. Tory Smith will he'll he'll get some targets, but my safety valve is Zach Ertz, and he's going to – I, I think he'll have somewhere in the neighborhood of six to eight catches at least in that game against Washington. I think I'm definitely that, starting Zach Ertz. You think, you think Zach Ertz finishes a top ten tight end this year? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, I think Carson Wentz takes that next step up. And, yeah, I definitely think we get a, 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 a insurgence of Zach Ertz. So, yeah. Agree. I, I definitely agree with you. As you just said. I love Zach Ertz. Um, the minute that Alshon Jeffrey and Torrey Smith became the Philadelphia Eagles, I was big on Zach Ertz as well. Um, yeah. I, I just it, I, he's he's old. He's due. He's due. I think he's the next tight end that's due. Um, not just for today, or not for this week, but for the season for sure. Um, a guy that dang, you took my pick. Uh, <laughs> a guy who um. Guy, I think that people probably overlooked. Um, he doesn't have a great week one, um, per se, but I will. I think moving on, he'll be better. Hunter Henry of the the Chargers, and I'll show a Charger here some love. Um, I think Hunter Henry is that guy that will play San Antonio. He was able to when Antonio Gates was even on the team. We had Hunter Henry 
still being able to grab, you know, two touchdowns in between. And, um, you know, he was still a guy that Rivers was looking for in the red zone. And that's, that's a check for any, you know, for any guy that you're kind of looking for in a tight end. Like, you know, you're looking just to get your six, seven points from that position possibly and move on unless you have Gronkowski or Kelsey or these other guys. Um, you're just in this tier, you're kind of just looking for guys that will give you that touchdown upside, that two touchdown upside. And I think that's Hunter Henry. Um, in a matchup against the Denver Broncos, uh, I just think um, he, he could be able to at least get a couple of those looks in the red zone and could, could definitely get a touchdown for you. Um, so that's a guy up by the top 10 for me that I'm definitely starting. Um, a guy that I will be sitting um, this week. Well, sorry, I got to give a bonus. I'm sorry, I got to put in a bonus. Kyle Rudolph is a guy that you guys. If a lot of people that were drafting definitely overlook Kyle Rudolph, and he will finish as a top six tight end. Book it. Um, because Kyle Rudolph is one of those guys that he was – he caught 88 balls. Kyle Rudolph caught, yeah. caught 88 last year, and was still under – he was still going under the radar this year. Um, so I'm loving Kyle Rudolph. A guy that I'm going to sit this week um, – and it's easy. It's Jason Witten to the Dallas Cowboys. Um, I've never loved Jason Witten. I can't stand him. I don't know why people still draft him. Um, Jason Witten to me, he's just a he's just a valve. I mean, he's not going to be a guy with a lot of upside for me. And um, you know, in a, yeah, even in a matchup against the Giants, I just don't love Jason Witten. Not only just for today, but for the season. I think his days, you know, he's just not a tight end. I I, I would even want on my roster. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and hey, you know what's time. funny? That's so funny you say that. That's so funny you say that because I was thinking about something. Go on, I would, I'll, I'll share that. <laughs> um. So yeah, those are my starts and sits for the tight end position this week. How about yeah. you? Yeah. Who are we looking yeah, at? No. For, for, for sitting, for sitting. sitting, for all of the exact reasons you just said about Jason Witten is the same reasons I'm saying about Antonio Gates. I'm not put. I'm just. I'm sorry. I think Hunter Henry is the guy in L.A. for the Chargers. I just think, even though you said, you know, he may struggle this week, and he may, I just I, I, I just don't have any confidence in Antonio Gates. I'm playing Hunter Henry over Antonio Gates 10 out of 10 times, but I'm sorry. Well, it's just well me. for me, it would be 9.5 out of 10, because Antonio Gates still has <laughs> – he still has that athletic ability um, – Jason Wynn just I don't know. He just for me he just never had it. Like but, um I I understand why you said Antonio Gates though. Um here so here's our section and then we'll and then we'll get up out of here and then we'll get to our next episode uh, this coming Tuesday. But um this is the section where we'll talk to guys who are possibly being um sorry, who are able to you are able to pick up on the waiver wire right now, guys that we think um, has a better outlook for the season. May not be, be may not be able to start today, um, but has great outlooks for the season. This is a section where we talk about also guys you could possibly trade for. Um, mm-hmm. so there, for me, there are there are three guys, but I'll start with my first, and that's Evan Ingram in the New York Giants. If he's on your waiver wire right now, please go grab him. Um, yeah, I normally don't like my teams with two tight ends, but I'll take I'll put I'll put a spot for Evan Ingram because he may not he may start today, and, I mean sorry he may start week one, um and he may look not you know he may not get the volume, but come late in the year I think Evan Ingram especially when we get more of these you know condition you know these you know especially NFC East you get games where it's all rainy the snow may come down, um I think Evan Ingram where he's getting he's elite you know, He's at least a t- you know he's outside the top twenty in tight ends. Could finish as a as a top fifteen tight end by the end of the year. He could be the Hunter Henry of last year, um, mm-hmm. in my opinion. So I would say you go out and grab him for sure. Um, if you don't go grab him, I think you are a fool. Um, <laughs> I think a guy where you can trade for possibly if you can. Heck, if he's on the waiver wire, run off this and go. Go grab him. That's Jamal Charles at Denver Broncos because mm. C.J. Anderson has proven that he can't hold the starting job. Yes, there's other guys like Devontae Booker and um, Jonathan Williams they just picked up. 
But I'm not a believer in either one of those guys. Booker had his time last year. Um, but I believe Jamal Charles, when healthy, can overtake C.J. Anderson. And then we're all of a sudden looking at a situation where you got a guy you drafted either very, very late or someone drafted very late, gave up on Jamal Charles, or you're just going to be able to hopefully just trade him off for something small, or you're able to pick him up. I think we'll be talking about that. We'll be talking about a guy who ended up going that late in the draft or, did, or didn't get drafted at all to a guy that could be RB2 status at the end of the year. So because of how Jamal Charles is and how he's been over his career. Um, my last take on a guy who could possibly be, he could be around, he could not be around, just depending on your leagues. Um, we'll be going for, um, I just think this guy for sure is a guy who may, well, he's just, he's probably on rosters right now, most likely, depending on how deep your league is. That's Corey Coleman of the Browns. I think, um, I think that's a guy you have to go at least try to go grab if you're going to trade one. But Corey Coleman is one of those receivers that we've seen with Cleveland, the Browns, they're a factory for running backs. Um, Josh Gordon, Terrell Pryor, <laughs> um, two bona fide guys that we can talk about right now um, that were a factory for the Browns. And the Browns weren't anything to talk about. And Corey Coleman has the stuff um, to be a guy where um, he could definitely be one of those guys at the end of the year we talk about. And he was like, well, I picked him off off the waiver wire where I traded for him very low um, and was able to get him. <laughs> So yeah. those, those guys to me are, are there is our section for pickups slash people you should possibly think about trading for. Oh, yeah. Well, one guy who uh, – Corey Coleman was one of my guys I had listed here. <laughs> it's so funny. <laughs> but I'll continue with the Corey because that's my name, of course. I'm going to say Corey Davis for uh, Tennessee. If he's still out there for you right now, which some cases he still is, if you have room to stash, stash. Eric Decker will definitely be a factor in Tennessee, but Corey Davis is the type of guy, and he's a rookie who can make plays. The boy can ball. Now, if you have the room to stash him, stash him. The weirdest trade, and I, it's so funny, I'm even saying this out of my mouth, to say trade for, if you can, but believe me, somebody will bite is Tom Brady. After last night's performance, you always have that one person who has him, who if you have a package that you could throw at them for Tom Brady, you may have to give up a little bit, but I think you got people panicking fantasy-wise on Tom Brady to where they're willing to shop him even after last night, and it's only week one. Take it for what you want, but I think you can trade. If you put the right package together, you can trade for Tom Brady. I definitely agree. You got to need one more. <laughs> no, well, I had Corey Coleman as the other one, but, you know, just off the top of my head, uh, somebody else who, if you have the room for him, I think if you can't get Tom Brady, that is. Uh, I would have to say um, Deshaun Watson. And the reason why I say that, I just don't think Tom Savage is going to hold that job in Houston. I really don't. And Deshaun Watson may be the spark that is in Houston that will get DeAndre Hopkins the ball. And <laughs> he'll be able to really, really put something into this already uh, they're the defending division champs, if I'm not mistaken. So he he can give them a spark. But I definitely think if you got room, if you want to take a chance, uh, you re if you really need a quarterback, uh, I think Deshaun, Deshaun Watson will be the quarterback of the Houston Texans within the next couple of weeks. I really do. I think I think so as well. I think Watson is in that same category as Kaiser, um, where those guys can definitely start. Um, you know, possibly, well, at least in this case, Watson um, could be a guy where we talk about in a couple of weeks where you go and you, you either got him or he didn't, and you all started and taking over a starting role, and you needed someone, you know, at least for your bye week, now you got him. Um, 
I think a guy, a guy that I'm going to um, – this is for a receiver, and it's going to be a guy who people are forgetting about, at least in like the you know, 10, team, 12 leagues. He may not be a starter today. Heck, he's hurt right now. That's Mike Williams of the of the Chargers. See? Yeah. Give, see, I'm giving the Chargers some love. Um, Mike Williams, I think, is a guy I really forgotten about. Um, heck, I even forgot about him in a sense. Um, in some of my drafts, when someone grabbed him, I was like, wait, what? Mike Williams? Oh, yeah, right. That's right. He's hurt. Oh, yeah, that's right. Um, so I think that he's a guy where you can stash and be like, okay, um, we'll see how this plays out. I think he's out for the first four weeks, I think. Um, he at least he, he at least he didn't have the surgery because I know he got off the pub list and then he didn't have the surgery. But if anything happens to Keelan Allen, um, obviously Tyrell Williams obviously gets in that, that area that gets a bump up to perform like he did last year. But if my guy my, if Mike Williams is healthy, I'd say you just just stash him on your bench right now. He's on the same category as Clint Galladay. Those two guys I would stash. And be like, okay, I'm gonna stash these guys and wait for the right the right timings and the things to happen, um, and that's that. Uh, so I think if um, he, he, I'm sure he's not on a lot of rosters. Mike Williams is, so I would just stash him and just wait. Yeah, absolutely. I would absolutely agree. So, wow, what a great podcast, man. Um, <laughs> for sure, um, guys, listen in. Um, Corey, tell the people where they can follow you at. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Uh, you can follow me at my kicks are my six at M-Y-K-I-C-K-S-A-R-E-M-Y-F-I-X. Literally every word is exactly how it's like. My kicks are my six. And that's on Twitter, Instagram. Just follow. <laughs> awesome. And everyone, you can follow me at Nick underscore Wilcox 25. Um, it's been a great show, Corey. Looking forward to our next show. And um, so give feedback. Feel free to send send you your questions via via social media for us. This is the Fantasy Six signing out. See you. Uh, listen, sorry, and we're signing out. <laughs>